Welcome to Become Famous Podcast, the ultimate destination for achieving fame in your industry. Join us for discussions as we uncover the strategies and secrets to becoming known, navigating cancel culture, and staying authentic. Stay tuned because here at Become Famous, the journey to fame begins now. Hi, this is Torin. Welcome to Become Famous podcast. Uh, We're doing another solo episode and it's part three of the series that is based on my book, Fame Revolution. And kind of the basis of Become Famous, some of you have asked me to go a little bit deeper into what do I mean? Because sometimes I make assumptions because I've read this for three and a half years. I've studied, gone deep dive. I'd say that I've got somewhat of a PhD in fame. Uh, I read almost everything there is. I've practically written the, the history of fame, which I'm hoping is going to come out next year. And so, so we're deeping dives. So the first episode, we talked about the definitions of fame. Fame is simply becoming known for what you do. If you want to learn more about the details, you can go into part one. Part two, I was really deeping into kind of like the ancients, where the where, what's the underpinning of of how the levels of fame and how we all need to become famous and how we all have it ingrained in us to become famous for what we do in some aspects. Not that we have to be national, international celebrities, but really about how to become known for what we do. And going back to Socrates and kind of the ladder of fame, that there is a pursuit of journey to becoming known for what you do. And so what I want to talk to today, because I think it's very important, is that we are in an age which has never happened before, at least when I've written, when I've like read history, there's never been a time where the regular person has as much power it has today. And I remember Loveline R. Brenna, who was um, an author, a 10 times author, um, a very known global leader within diversity leadership. She's been help, helping create the standard for ISO standard, which is a standard organization that creates international standards for companies to follow and help guide them to be better corporations. And she's part of developing that. And I remember interviewing her because she says, this is a, this is best time to be alive uh, because you're creating so much impact as an individual, but you have a lot of responsibility. And I, believe that we are forgetting that when we're on social media. I'm not going to be like, you don't do this, don't do that. But I think there is a component of being really mindful that something that goes out onto the social media sphere can suddenly go viral and change your life. And I think this really got honed in on me in such deep level. It really brought fear into me was when I was in Congress and I remember this guy had written an email and it was supposed to only go to his friend, his close friend. And he was kind of like bashing, critiquing his date. It was quite crass, right? But if it was just a personal conversation, a private conversation, we've all had those conversations right behind the scenes, at least before we didn't have social media looking down our neck on our actions. But what was fascinating was that email went viral and it went all over the congressional staffers. And I remember reading, I was horrified. Then it went to blogger, the Wonkette blogger, which was the biggest blogger at the time. And it just went like brush fire. It ended up in, in the trade magazines for, for working in government, like um, the Hill, the roll call. And it was just, and then it went into public television and within, I think it was in 48 hours, he got fired and couldn't get a job in DC again from one email. I got, that just shook me to the ground. And so I think I'm much more mindful because of that. And I I'm careful. Right. And, and I think we should be careful but at the same time. You can't be so careful that you can't live. Right. But it just really shook me that we got to be careful with what we say and what we do. And what I've observed since COVID, which is what I say in the book, is really when the fame revolution happened, where we become known for what we do. 86% of the world has a smartphone. AI is your friend, but AI is not your friend. And in all of this, we need to have the human, the human person that's going to be there. And what I realized was that the lessons of me having worked in government and politics, presidential campaigns, senatorial campaigns, so forth, worked with CEOs and leaders, worked with the Norwegian government, worked with political leaders behind the scenes, training them on on messaging and speaking and so forth, is that the lessons and strategies that I learned then 
I think we all need that. And that's why I took the time to write the book. Like my book is in three parts. You got the first part, which is just giving you the theories, which is basically um, the, the first part, the series I was talking about. Part two is really about we all need to become known and, and look at ourselves as a public figure. And what's fascinating is public figure right now is it's got a legal definition. And when you are deemed as a public figure, you don't have the same rights as a private person. But there is this quasi thing that's happening because if you suddenly, if you are actually, if you read the legal document, if you're actually pursuing yourself to be out there, and isn't that what we all do when we're on social media, we're posting, we're actively pursuing. So if you suddenly go viral, you can get into the status of this quasi public figure status. And what does that mean? Well, it means you don't have as many rights. And, uh, and then we also know if we use some music that we didn't really own and it's copyrighted, right? You gotta, there's all these little things we have to be mindful. And, and it's really about taking more responsibility that we are all public figures becoming known for what you do. And what I really hope people understand is to understand this complexity that we have become now, not just a private citizen, but we're all public figures. We might not be that legally, but I think legally it's going to have to change because we are all that are on social media pursuing something are, are putting ourselves into the public square as public figures. So my prediction is that they're going to have, they're, that some definitions are going to change. And I do believe we're going to lose more of our private citizen rights as, as this goes on. I could be wrong, but that's just me on the sideline observing as a, not as a lawyer, but just as someone that is really fascinated about this topic. And so what do I mean by being public figure? Well, I'll, I think it's interesting because when you work in Hall DC, Washington DC, which is I did, um, we always called ourselves Hollywood for the uglies <laughs> because we do the same thing as that someone does for Hollywood star. You are the commodity. The product is the person and you behind the scenes are helping prop that up. The person you're helping create messages. You're helping them put them out there. And haven't you noticed yourself that you actually have to have a team to help you? Uh, social media is just taking over. Our reputation is so valuable that if we, if we don't, be good caretakers of it. And it goes down, you could actually lose billions of dollars. And that's what some companies have done when they haven't really been mindful of who their client is, who is their customer. And you're seeing that we are politicizing uh, corporations and companies. And what does that really mean? It's like, you're not going to go to a company if you don't if they don't have the same values as you. So you're seeing a value driven society, a society where even companies are looking, have to look at themselves as public figures. And I remember talking to Ingville, who was a, one of the women that I interviewed here, who's a mother uh, of a daughter, seeing how she's curating, she's managing her public perceptions. She's mindful of what's going out there much more than her, her, her herself as a mom. And, and what she is seeing is the the thing of us of her company that she worked for or companies that she was representing was that they had to suddenly take political stance on certain issues on foreign policy and and that's what you're seeing more and more because as we're being inundated with so much information attention what really grabs us is the person because the person is a story in itself um, storytelling has been so important. I think the next phase is really going to be more on the person itself because we as people can be a story. And I think with AI, it's going to be much more this touch of the human heart and who we are. And so, uh, what's interesting was her company had to be, uh, standing up for issues. So what you're seeing is that this sense of public figure is influencing the way a company is acting and also how a person is acting. And so what does it really mean to be a public figure? Well, a public figure is the merging of who you are and what you offer. That's the simple thing. And I have in my, in my, um, here in my book, it's like a yin and a yang. It's like, you're the person and you're the product. And that is really hard for people to grasp. And I was remembering talking to a client last week and he didn't understand it. And I was like saying, you are, you're John here, you own the company, but the company is John. 
right? So you are the owner, but you're the company and the product is you. So, so you're like John everywhere and you can't manage all the Johns in the company. You can't, it's not a single endeavor anymore. And it's when you look at yourself as a product, that can be kind of hard. It's like you're selling yourself, but you're util you're utilizing yourself as a vehicle to get people's attention. And by getting people's attention, people are then interested in what you're doing. And that is not easy for us millennials or Gen Xers. That uh, the Gen Ayers, which I've worked worked with, you can just see how they have it so intuitive. And that's like my friend Ingville with her daughter was that she knew exactly how to curate her content, right? And we are losing part of this, part of being completely ourselves on social media. But are we really, because if you've lived in a small town, like I have like less than 3000 people, everyone knows your name. And what's really happened right now is the globe, in a sense, has become a village where everyone knows your names and you need to mind your P's and Q's. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to be honest, but there is this extra layer of mindfulness we need. And so the public figure is really about looking at yourself from two different vantage points is put the hat on as the product, put the hat on as the person. And when you, and, and what that also does is, is make showcasing you that you need a team. You need to have strategies in place to really think about how are you interacting and how are you managing? And it's not just marketing, pushing out ads, pushing this, but it's really about like as a politician does brings their whole person personhood in. And I think people get really, frightened by that. And I think this is why people don't like the word famous becoming famous for what you do. They just want to be visible. It sounds safer to be visible and not to be famous, which is the definition the way I have to fame. It's kind of the same thing, but there is this component of becoming known and the challenges of that. And we can't, we can't underestimate that. I, I totally understand. And I remember when I was in, when I was in DC and we were Hollywood for the all uglies. And I love what Jack Valenti says. And I quote him in my book, Washington, Hollywood spring from the same DNA. And, and it really is the same DNA. It is, uh, what you offer is with who you are. You are bringing part of yourself. And then the whole question is how much do you bring of yourself? And I think that's really hard is like looking that you have two identities or two personas. You have the private persona and the public persona. And a lot of the public persona goes out into the social media, but it could even be like how you're interacting publicly, but it, there is this component. And I remember this quite distinctively when I was looking for a job. It was in, in the um, 2000s, right when LinkedIn was becoming a big deal. And I have always been the person that gives out the resume in person, always makes this personal touch. But when the gatekeepers are there and that personal touch doesn't even reach the person, right? It just gets thrown by the wayside. You have to work with the algorithms. You have to work with what's out there and follow all these rules and and how do you distinguish yourself right and i remember my consultant that was helping me find uh find the job said you need to have at least 500 followers and i was like 500 followers wow and or else they're not even gonna look at you and i was like oh my gosh and then you're pursuing all of this networking and you have to start thinking about how do you pursue yourself and how do you look on LinkedIn. So I got consultants helping me to write my LinkedIn profile, how to write my story. And I learned quite a bit. And what was really fascinating was my LinkedIn profile got so well, or well, algorithmic. I wasn't even looking for a job, but I had a high level executive a search firm reaching out to me on behalf of Tesla, thinking, really believing that I should be part of their team, uh, heading up a, um, an, a European component of their company. And I was like, what? <laughs> I've never led anything. But for some reason, they liked whatever was algorithmic or how I wrote my LinkedIn story. And um, I went, I got to the uh, second round and between the second and third round, they were asking me basically more the mechanics of the company. Like, have I managed 350 people? And I'm like, no, I haven't. So I didn't get it. But what it just showed you was how powerful it is and how you are mindful about how you're pursuing yourself or how you're looking out there publicly. And so I thought that was, 
that was mind blowing to me. And then when Facebook becomes more and more big, you're learning how to interact with it. But really to think of yourself as, as the uh, public figure. And I think what I'm going to read here is some of the things that we've kind of lost. We've lost the gift of being completely anonymous and thriving and traded for visibility to gain influence. There is a component that we need that we've traded for that. Like a small mom and pop shop can't no longer not be on, have an Instagram account, right? There is the marketplace is no longer just the physical place that you're in. The marketplace is social media and everyone goes, duh, of course. But I think there's something about, and that's why I wrote the book was there's something about recognizing that how things have changed. And it gives us a different mindfulness and help us to really be strategic about where we want to go. We've lost privacy and traded for convenience of online interactions, selling products and sharing our viewpoints online. We have, sh we have given up. And that's why I'm thinking the legal definition of what a public figure is and us having more responsibility of how we are pre presenting ourselves online, I believe is going to be coming down in the next five years. I just can't see it not, but I could be wrong, but I'm just, that's really where I believe we've lost the clear boundary from private and public lives and have traded for having a platform on social media to voice our opinions, advocate issue or sell our products. And, and that's really uh, what, what it is. And, and that's like with politics, you're, you're selling yourself to get the vote. Right. And so you're standing out there, you're doing those things and we're doing the same thing. It's like my client from the beginning of the book says, I don't want to be a movie star, but there is a point where you have these lights like I have right now. I have a microphone here and I'm talking and I'm, and to be honest with you, I'm an introvert and have always loved being behind the scenes and have had to really train myself to be out here. And I think it's fascinating is the more you train, the more you practice, the better you are at being that public figure. And I think that is a really, really important, uh, important thing. So I think this is where we really just need to see is that we have a great power and responsibility is what is what um, Maveline was talking about. But there is a reluctance. Do we really have to become famous? What is it? Well, we can become we can become luxury fame, become known, become visible. But there is a component where we really need to think about how to become known. And my whole my whole point is really that we all need to be visible. We all need to be out there, be visible with what we do to find a way. And, and I think it's interesting because, you know, is there a fame inflation? Is there an inflation where it's going to be hard to become known? And I think it's not just about being online, but it's really about being offline as well. The on and offline interaction, I think is going to be more and more important than ever because um, capitalizing on meeting people. And I think because of AI, we're going to be craving that more. We're going to be going to more events to actually see people in that. And I think what's interesting is, so what is the public figure? Public figure is someone that is, is a person and a product. And I really think the lesson is that you are also a product and there's an expectations of you going out there showing who you are, like the prescriptive language of press releases, the rules, the corporate way of doing things. There's probably still companies that are doing that, but really right now it's all about putting yourself out there. And I really like, and if you ever want to read, if you're an employee or someone that works in corporate, I don't need to become known. Yeah, you do. You need to become visible. Um, you need to become visible for what you do. Uh, because uh, what Carla Harris, which is, she's got a fantastic platform on, on the whole thing about, about sharing your voice in the corporate, corporate sphere. And what she talks about is you need to become noticed for who you are. And she tries to create this great story of her life where, you know, she was an Emmy award gospel singer, but never talked about it in her financial uh, positioning at Morgan Stanley. And, but then when she started melding, and this was before really social media, but she started melding part of who she was. It's this beautiful flavor of who she is. Well, no one, how many people are an Emmy award singer in, in finance, right? So her bringing that in got clients so interested in her and just wanted to talk to her and get to know her. And, and it was probably her ace in getting, and that's what she says. It was one of her greatest advantages. And so it's really finding your voice. So even employees need to, to have it, but this is where I think we're going into a phase where corporate and companies together are going to have to find a way on how to interact with this, because it's hard to know what to do and what not to do with it. And I think this is where, 
I give an example in the book of a bus driver who is kind of fun and crazy. He's called himself Norway Rob and the company shuts him down. But could there have been guidelines so that it fit within the company culture and it let him showcase his colors because it was benefiting the company in the sense people got to know know the company but you want to become known in the right way and so this is where there's going to be much more continued dialogue on who is the employee the employer how do you interact and it was so interesting because when i did a podcast a couple of weeks ago with um a branding expert steve moritz he was like basically when we were talking about it was that employees today own their brand because we are all public figures, the employee owns their branding. I think now in today, you cannot expect a corporation cannot expect someone to just utilize their brand. So like when I used to use in corporate, we'd have the ambassadors, oh, go out there and share, do your stories, blah, blah, blah. But now um, that's a value commodity that a person brings. So like an employee right now, if you have two employees, one, both of our accountants, one has like, 50,000 followers on LinkedIn or TikTok and the other one has nothing he brings to the table his his craft being an accountant but the gentleman with all of the uh, social media phone brings this little extra and what what some of the dialogue has been does that mean that we're going to charge for that is that does that mean that that I can get more money in my salary because I have this following, right? Because it becomes this extra thing where you're helping. And what you're seeing right now is advertising doesn't work. It's the organic. It's getting more down to earth with people. And so who can best promote you is your employees. But can you expect them to do it without paying them extra? And I think that's a really fascinating debate and dialogue that I'm, that I'm looking forward to continuing because what does it actually mean to be a public figure? So we all have this component of becoming known for what we do. We're going to be out there. We have the yin and the yang. And what's interesting is that companies in themselves are going to want to be that it's the person centric branding. And what I really like is Jim Stengel, who wrote the book grow, who I would say is the, is the um, forefather of this whole movement, because what he did was, uh, he was saying a brand is a business, essentially reason for being the higher order benefits it brings to the world. A brand ideal of improving people's lives is the only sustainable way to recruit, unite, and inspire all stakeholders a business interacts with from employees to customers. And so Jim was really groundbreaking. He really revolutionized Procter & Gamble where he um, – breathe life into the brands but what he did was he, he looked at them as people like they had a purpose and in the purpose that's usually what humans have right but he really brought in the human centric part into the brands which i thought was really really powerful and he was so successful so from 2001 to 2008 the company soared sales they were doubling while earnings urged five times right and he tapped into something really really powerful and then what he did was he did research with i would definitely read the book grow i think it's one of the most groundbreaking books on uh and it's really been been the bible of my of my career when i was working in corporate because finding the brand purpose of a company is so important and so and what he says is over a decade so they did this research he did this with uh, miller brown's vast database and basically what they did they did a decade long growth study they selected brands with the highest customer bonding bonding scores from miller brown's vast database and when comparing these brands dubbed the stengel 50 uh to the standards and poor they observed a 400 percent return on investment 400 percent is that a lot and um over a decade the stengel 50 expanded by 393% in stark contrast to the S&P's 500 decline of 7%. And he really started this movement of looking at the, that companies are human centric. So what you're seeing is we people are becoming more product oriented and companies are becoming more human centric. And really it is in essence that both are becoming public figures. You need the person and the product. And so I, I actually have in here like a sheet that I do where you're dividing them in between product and person. How do you, how can you look at yourself in that component? Like you have the personal story impact and then the market value of what you're doing. 
uh, public feedback versus product differentiation, emotional engagement versus sales volume. So anyways, um, looking at those both components, I think is really the future. And when you're looking, when we were, when I was working for political candidates, you know, that's kind of what you're, you're doing. And so I think the hardest part and is kind of the personal, like how I don't want to share my personal life. And I have several clients like that. I had a client that, that recently uh, got married and I was horrified because the person forgot to tell me that they're getting married. And I'm like, wait, this is, could really help capitalize you. And her and her husband decided we are not going to share anything. And, and that's completely fine, but you can share something differently and allude to it. Right. So this is where you're going to be in a continual debate on what is it that you're going to share? What is it you're not going to share? Uh, and what I always recommend is that you have five topics that are personal that you then can liberally share that makes you feel comfortable. And I don't believe that being a public figure is being like a reality star where you can just blah everything. I don't really think that's as effective. And, and I think we've gone death ears to that kind of um, way of being. I could be wrong, but that's just my, my interpretation of it. But I do believe what's really, really important is that uh, you find a way to communicate some of those issues. And that's what the next thing I'm going to talk about in the next episode is really how do you safeguard yourself in this, in this era. But I'm going to end it with a really important story to show you the contrast between looking at yourself as a public figure and looking at yourself as not as a public figure. And I think this is really one of the most important life lessons. And this is what I tell my clients that evaluating do i really want to go forward with some kind of a strategy because you do need a strategy and i can think the quote that i like is no matter how great your work is if you do not take take the time to tell the story behind your work others will not appreciate what you're doing and so and we all know that marketing is important promotions is important but i think there in this day and age of being a public figure you need to be more mindful of that and there's a different kinds of strategy to it and so i want to contrast what I contrast in the book was this world famous painter, Vincent Van Gogh, which we all know, like many painter clients. And then he did not invest in building a name, but he was lucky and had a sister in law who intuitively knew how to do it. And that was Joe, Joanne Van Gogh Bonger. And so she stood alone in 1890 after her husband, Theo, brother Van Gogh, passed away. And six months um, after, Vincent's suicide. So she was alone with 200 unwanted paintings and she's got small children. And so what does she do? Well, she was resourceful and she really built his legacy. She built Van Gogh's legacy. And, and what does she do? She started with working with museums, the painters, art collectors. She's basically doing a campaign. It's what you do in, in public relations. You do a campaign, getting the word out and building a name and staying famous. And uh, what was so fascinating is what she did was she created this whole apparatus around it. So you even have a Vincent Gogh foundation today. And I think that's one of the reasons why you know a lot more about Vincent Van Gogh than you do know about Picasso. When I was younger, Picasso was much more known, but that he had just recently passed. So there was still some remnants of of a legacy, but the legacy building that Vincent Van Gogh has done and his foundation is absolutely fantastic. Contrasting that to, to my author that I, to my painter that I work with, uh, and his name was TK. And what was really interesting is that I was really passionate about, about painting. And so I saw this painter and I fell in love. I just fell in love with the paintings and I took my savings and I paid and my mother was horrified that I did that. And I told the painter, and this was in Norway, and I told the painter, you know, when I come to the US, I would love to promote you. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing, but I, it was like my first PR project. I didn't, and I loved it. I loved talking about it. So I went, I just, without knowing anything, I just went to the galleries, showed my little portfolio that she gave me, and like she gave me these little slides. And I go in there and talk about, about the paintings. And by doing it enough, I meet this really known gallery owner at the time. It doesn't really, it doesn't exist now, but it was really big at the time in Alcapulco and in, um, in Los Angeles. And he says, this is fantastic. If you just give me 12 paintings, I will showcase her. And it was amazing, right? So she gets showcased. Her paintings go up a hundred percent. I get like, um, and I got like four paintings from her, but she never finished the 12 because her paintings made so much money. 
So she took that money and sold it and went for the short term thinking and never built the brand. And so I had these four paintings that were quite valuable at the time. And I was like, I'm going to cash in 20 years later, thinking that, that they would be even known even well, more valuable. And when I cash in, she was not even in the registry of painters in Norway. They went from zero. And I'm contrasting that to, and I think most painters are like that. They don't really invest in themselves. This is why looking at yourself as a public figure, looking at yourself as a company where you have another team that takes on some of the talent to help propel you is so important. And so with Joe, with Vincent van Gogh, she took the time to build the name, build everything out in the way she wanted it to be done. Right. And, and, and look today, we all know who Vincent van Gogh is. So really what it comes down to is building a name and staying famous takes strategic investment. And I think this is where I believe more of us need to take a different investment that we used to do. It's not just about marketing, but it's about looking at, when you look at yourself as a public figure, you're going to look at the way you do things a little bit differently, adding more PR into what you're doing, public relations, looking at your stakeholders, looking at who you know, and we're going to talk about in the next episode, but building a name is a strategic investment. And so what, what I say is I have some rules for this. And so I'm going to just give those as the ending, but it's that you first always look beyond your client. And I think this is where public relations is really helpful because in marketing, you're looking for the client that's going to buy the product. But public relations is about looking beyond that, looking at the people, looking at uh, other people that can help you, but not just help you, but you help them. It's becoming like a civic citizen in what you do. And so I think that's very, very important in this age. Then the next thing I would say is, and I'll go more into detail with that later, but the second thing is being a public figure means you are a public servant. And I think that's really what plays into it. You're not just this marketing apparatus. And you're seeing that with even companies today are what's their, what's their corporate social responsibility. Now it has to be genuine. It has to be something that goes in here, right? So you can't just plop these things around. That's why they're not effective. It's really about, again, being a public figure, you, the person, you, the product. And as the person, what really jives you? And that's like the company, what really jives you to want to be uh, what do you want to give back to the public? It's about your reputation. It's about not just about what you're offering and what you're selling, but it's all the stuff around it. And I think being a public servant is really the way is looking at yourself, not, and that's what a public figure is. They look at not just about what they are selling out there, like a politician. They're also thinking about what they're giving. And even with the music, music industry or film, they always have this nonprofit. They have all this platform of doing something other than just themselves. And the ones that are most successful, you're seeing they have that platform. They have something beyond what they are transactionally making money on. Third, authentic connection is the currency of the fame revolution. And I really, I'm going to talk a whole episode about authenticity. Authenticity is, is really, a strange bird in a way, because it's not, uh, you would think authentic is about being honest. No, it's about the spirit of you internally, like a great um, narcissist can look authentic and be someone that we all believe in, right? Or uh, it's not about that, but it's practicing your authenticity, finding a way to communicate what's your differentiator in a very effective way is so important. Um, it is the currency. It's what opens the door. And they actually have like the study of quantum physics where they say frequency wise, authenticity is the highest level. It's, we just feel it when it's authentic and we attract ourselves to it and it's just authentic. So I thought that was really interesting. Fourth, again, you are the product. Uh, what, how is your personal brand perceived? How are you marketing self? What do you offer? What do you want to say? You know the ins and outs of social media, learning all those components, but learning that you are a product that actually drives sales, which is kind of hard to do. And I think what I sense sometimes that's hard for my clients is that when people look at them as a product, they feel used and abused. But I, I remind them, you, it's not so. It's just that you are also a product. You're just not a person. So th it's that conflict there. And I think this is what's so important to discuss, dialogue, and really feel it and, and learn how to manage that because it's not an easy component to manage. And fifth, it's be you. 
I think this is the most important role. You want to be brave because the greatest competitive advantage is you. And it's being you, 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 you. And you're seeing those people that are really out there, just you, them, they do very, very well. Now, being you and them doesn't mean you have to share your dirty laundry. Being you and them doesn't mean you have to be crazy and going on all the stuff. Uh, sometimes the consistency is the best thing of just staying the same thing. Like there's this woman I follow on TikTok. She's just been doing the same thing every single day, every single day. It's, it's not an issue that a lot of people are interested in, but she's getting a lot of traction because she's consistent, right? So that's the ninth thing. And then the second one is to have a support team. And I think really what I was trying, and I was telling my, one of my clients is you're so, you should be happy that you invested in this because you are the owner of your company, John, you're the, you're the owner of John Inc. John Inc. has a product called John. So you have all these John Johns and you need to have some support around it. You can't do it yourself. I think that's the key thing. I don't do things myself. I have someone helping me with my social media. I have someone helping me out with my podcast. I, everyone needs someone. They need a support team. You cannot do this by yourself. It's a profession that's gone so big and it's really a component. Just like you have a accounting department, you're going to want to have a public figure content marketing department on who's managing you. You can't do it by yourself. And then seven, you need to have a strategy and plan just versus TK, the artist that I had that was just going for the short term windfall versus the long term, which is what Joe did with Van Gogh. And we all know where Van Gogh is today, uh, breaking grounds, utilizing his art in different forms and has really made a name beyond any of the artists. And when I was young, Picasso was much, much, much bigger than Van Gogh. But I would say Van Gogh now has a better name and is more recognized by the younger generation. So, and then the good part at the end of this, and this is when I interviewed John Doring, who is the leader of Scottsdale Living, who was so fun to meet with him because we have the same kind of like, we love art. And he was one of the people that helped propel Park West Gallery, which really took art to the cruise ships, took it more to the public, to, to regular folks, and really created a huge multi-billion dollar business and category within the whole art world. And what he says is new platforms create new opportunities and value is driven by distribution. So there is this sense of, again, thinking of ourselves as products. How are we distributing what we're thinking? And, and, and I, I am still struggling with that and I'm getting help with people from that. And I'm really grateful for those people. But again, you need a team. You can't do it all by yourself. So that, my friend, is the podcast on public figure and next uh and next week we're going to talk about safeguarding your fame like how do you handle those cancel culture folks because it's not really easy um and there is a plan to it and i think it's important to to think about that because in in essence when you are a public figure you're responsible for what you say and what you do have fun when you're out there but when you're mindful about public figure, you start thinking strategic about what do I want to share? What do I want to share? And that's what the Generation A is doing so intuitively. And we can learn a lot from them. So until next time, have a great day. Thank you for listening to Become Famous Podcast. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review our show. Your support helps us keeping bringing you valuable insights on achieving fame in your industry keep shining and see you next time.